My name is Marvin Boogaloo Smith. I was born in 1948 in Englewood, uh, Ingle, Englewood, New Jersey. So let me tell you how I got into the business, how I got into the recording and the drum business. I went to Town Sound Recording Studio. When I got to high school, when I got to high school, they had this thing called work study. And I, I remember I couldn't wait to get to be a senior. Because when you're a senior, I saw the seniors go to school at 8 o'clock in the morning, like everybody else, but 12 o'clock, when people took their lunch, I saw these seniors go and get in their cars and leave. And I didn't never see them until the next day. So when I got to high school, I asked a woman, I asked a counselor, I said, well, what what is that uh, thing I see when the seniors go out and getting in them cars and leaving? And I don't, I don't never see them until the next day. And they said, they're doing work study. Well, what is work study? They said, you go to school in the morning and then you go to work in the afternoon at some job in the town and you get a grade on it. So when I was a senior, when I was a senior, they opened up this uh, recording studio in my hometown of Englewood. Englewood? Anyone? Um, it was, uh, okay, so Englewood. That's my hometown. It's very famous. Big people live there. Dizzy Gillespie, Sarah Vaughn, George Benson. They lived uh, on what's called the hill. Now we lived in Englewood Cliffs, and it's but uh, we uh, anyway. That's up in the mountains, and it's uh, big mansions and stuff. So anyway, Town Sound, Town Sound. It's called uh, after Ed Townsend. Ed Townsend. He was uh, uh, went on to be a famous producer in uh, Hollywood. Anyway, so they opened up this studio. I wanted to go down there. See, I wanted to be a drummer. I had to be about 16 or 17. I said, I want to be a drummer. And the way that I can be a drummer, to continue this, I don't want to get me no job in a, a pet shop or as an auto mechanic because I don't know anything about cars and I don't care anything about pets. What I want to do is play drums. So I'm going down there to Town Sound. I'm going to fill me out an application. And I'm going to get me a job as a sweet drum man. I'm going to get the go get it man, the go get the hamburger man, the go get lunch man, and the switchboard man. Because one day, one day there's going to be a hole up there, and they're going to say, Boogaloo. We got a group up here, and we need a drummer. The drummer didn't show. Can you come up? And I would say yes. I knew I would say yes. But in the meantime, I was running the switchboard. I was getting them lunch. I was doing the sweeping up. I was cleaning the toilets. I was doing anything I could just to be in that building. So I got the job, and I did all that. And then one day, one day, Bernard Purdy, Bernard Purdy, one of the famous drummers, he used to live in Teaneck, and I lived in Englewood. Englewood? No, okay. Uh, Bernard couldn't come to the gig, couldn't come to the recording studio. 
and they said exactly what I thought they would say. They said, Boogaloo. Well, Marvin, see, I wasn't named Boogaloo then. I hadn't gone to Europe and all that stuff. But they said, Marvin, we heard that you play drums. We gotta make this session. The musicians are here. Can you come and play drums? I threw the drum, the broom down. I threw the switchboard down. And I went to Studio A. And I sat at the drums. And I played my first recording day. After that, they never asked me to go back to the broom or nothing. None of that. They never asked me, and I never did none of that no more. I was actually playing drums, and I loved it. I was in school in the morning doing regular stuff that you did in school. At 12 o'clock, I was in the studio, and it was professional. And it was, it was the only wooden studio. It was made totally out of wood, which is a really good thing to make a studio out of wood. Everybody from James Brown to Wilson Pickett recorded there, and I was the drummer on a lot of those cuts. So I was around all those people all my life, and I learned the recording engineer, and now, man, when I look back on it, it's really strange that I'm the CEO of a 48 track recording studio. My life is like a fairy tale. And that's my story. try to go right through this thing from being a little girl from Youngstown, Ohio, where my mother used to sing around the house. This what, what later I knew were standards. So I knew a lot of standards. All of me, all of me. Oh, she loved all this. She didn't know anything about jazz. But when I was 17, I think, a cousin of mine gave me three records. It was Ramsey Lewis, Miles Davis, and I can't remember the third. <laughs> but three fantastic. I didn't know what it was, and I took it home, and I, I was just smitten. I don't know. I, I think it was the feel. There was something about it, and when I heard Miles, I, 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 I thought him singing. I heard, I heard singing. So what I did was. I joined Columbia Records. Who remembers Columbia Records? <laughs> for a penny. And for a penny. Uh, and, and, and then there was all these categories, so I ticked off jazz. And I began to get all these fantastic records. And I started to listen. It was, it, it was over for me. So and meanwhile, I graduated from high school, and I, I went to college. I didn't even know what college was, to be honest with you. This was in 1959. But I went anyway to get away from home. Get away. And, and so I went to the furthest college in, in Ohio, Miami of Ohio. So, so, I wouldn't, so I wouldn't go home too often, you know? Because, I mean, I was shy. I'm talk, I talk a lot now, but I, I really was shy. Well, lucky me. There was no jazz education. So I was classical, oh, so ooh, that's not bad. I learned some stuff. But 
there was a jazz music metal fashion, and he said, so there was a trombonist, a wonderful trombonist who had been in the service, so he knew about jazz. And and I used to sing around the dorm, a cappella. I don't know, I don't know. Funny Valentino, you know, the whole thing. And one, and my roommate, who was a classical major, she said, you you ought to sing for John Watson. He'll tell you if you could sing, because I already knew I was following something. I didn't know I was going to be a jazz singer. So sure enough, I went to sing for John Watson, and the next thing I was singing on weekends, I was in his band, ten bucks, ten dollars a gig. Well, now it's up to fifty. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, only just I try not to. Be, uh, but I, this is actually going to lead to something. Ah, but I'll sing a little too. Um, so I had, a, by the time I had four years of college, I had a repertoire. I knew stuff. I knew the tunes. I loved them. Yeah, and I and I was the singer in the band, so I got to sing three tunes. I tell my my students this, you know, say, you know, and they got to play blah blah blah, and then I get my three tunes, and and, and that got old after a while because I wanted to be more a part of the band. But man, did I learn a lot. Anyway, blah blah blah. Fast forward. I went to New York when I was 21. How brave! Yeah. Nobody left Ohio. How brave! I didn't know anybody, you know. But I knew I had to go to. Because guess what? How lucky me. Miles was playing, Train was playing, Sonny Rollins. I even saw Eric Dolphy, Monk at the Five Spots. So only to say it was a fantastic time. But also, and this pertains to this situation, why it was even asked here, suddenly they decided they didn't want to read music anymore. And certain people, and in the loss, to continue it, started to play free, and I happened to have a loft, because I was, I was doing office temp work. Oh, I was doing office temp work, typing. I didn't want to teach, I was too young. You know, I did office temp work, and I was invited to dinner in a loft on Miss Bernard Street. Who knows it? Miss yeah. Bernard Street. And, and I said, this is where I gotta live. This is where I can make music. So I did, $80 a month. And we played, and suddenly, and next to me was these musicians, these uh, instrumentalists, doing all this free jazz. And there I was, and Jean Lee took their connection. The beautiful Jean Lee. She was, there weren't too many singers doing this. You know, why would you want to do that? Oh, well, I did. I did. And so, anyway, the, I had the loft. And again, I think you were telling a story about where was I going to get a gig? I was nobody. Where was I going to get a gig? You know, I, I called Art Delugoff. What? This little girl from Ohio. You know, why would he hire me? He was so wonderful, too. He said, you know, why would I hire you? <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that great? But isn't that great? You know, usually they just don't call you back. And, and he was right. So I started anyway, short story, long, <laughs> I decided I had to sing because you can't learn this without doing it. So I started doing concerts, jazz at the loft. I wonder if there's one person here who ever went, anyway, it doesn't matter, jazz at the loft and everybody, even Sam Rivers play, a lot of people play at this loft where everybody wasn't famous then, you know. And anyway, it was free jazz and I am free in and I am out. And end of story, but if you ever want to come talk to me, I got a lot of stories. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm going to tell you now. That's what got me here. That's what got me here. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. 
I was born in 1930 in Brooklyn, New York. I'm a saxophonist and uh, somewhat of a composer. And I've been performing and recording since 1948. Working with great musicians, the uh, modern jazz quartet, Miles Davis, Art Blakey. I've played and recorded with Coleman Hawkins and Charlie Parker. Okay. Well, New York is about people living next to each other. And if you want to play an instrument, a musical instrument, you're going to have to be open to the fact that your neighbors might have to go to work while you want to practice your instrument. And that's always been a big, big problem for me. So anyway, um, I was living down on Grand Street in the Lower East Side, by the way, and, and the same situation was obtained. You know, people in the apartment over me. I had a problem because, as I said, I'm a very sensitive person. I don't like to bother other people. And of course, that basically was the problem. So I happened to be walking in the, uh, the neighborhood of, uh, you know, on Delancey Street. And anyway, I was walking. And I was sort of walking towards the bridge that goes to Brooklyn. I saw the steps leading up the bridge, and I just thought, you know, I had never thought about it. And I walked over, and I walked up the steps. And there in front was this great expanse. Nobody up there in the middle of the day. So I said, okay, and I, I walked across the bridge. I walked across the bridge. Nobody walking in any direction. There were uh, trains coming across the bridge, automobile traffic, and below them was the river. And the boats were coming up and down the river. And it occurred to me that this would be a perfect place to bring my horn and practice in perfect peace. And I wouldn't be disturbing anybody, and I could blow as long as I wanted and as hard as I wanted. See, I'd taken a sabbatical basically at the time. So I'd go up there day and night, and nobody would bother you. New York is a very cosmopolitan place. The people are very sophisticated. They walk by, they see some guy playing, and they don't give a hoot. They just walk by. And I'd be up there. I took my friends with me at different times. It, it was just a, a gift from heaven. And I stayed on that bridge until being discovered up there by a, a jazz writer who uh, lived in Brooklyn and uh, walked across the bridge. And so uh, he wrote this story. And uh, the news got out, oh, Sonny's on the bridge. And it turned into a, a very romantic story, which indeed it is. This lone musician practicing on the bridge under the New York skyline, and the boats going down below. And sometimes I'd blow my horn at the boats and they'd answer back. It was a real magical experience. Eventually though, I had to come back. I had to come back, I had to go to work. But you know, I still went there to practice. But you know, that was a that was a really high, high point in my life. I mean, I'm just eternally grateful. I'm grateful and I'm paid to do what I love, to play my saxophone. I'm grateful that I'm able to make a living and make some 
heart. And by the way, I had a nook in that bridge where I couldn't be seen. The cars and the trains, they went by and no one could see me. So you see, it was just a perfectly private spot. And that's my bridge story. Thank you.